Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, happy Heart Day, because it is Heart Day all over the world. And you're very welcome to the Irish Heart Foundation's webinar today, Her Heart Matters. You might have heard of this campaign, which has been running for a month. I'm a very proud ambassador for it this year. So it's putting a spotlight on women's heart health, which is under-researched and also often we don't realize the danger we are in at various stages of our lives. So today we're going to give you all the information. We have a great panel of experts here. Right beside me here is Maura Canning. Now Maura is living with high blood pressure and she's also an ambassador for her Heart Matters campaign. Uh, next to um, Maura is um, Dr. Samantha Dockery, a senior lecturer in the School of Applied Psychology at University College Cork. And then we have Dr. Nicola Corcoran, GP and doctor in complex menopause clinic in the National Maternity Hospital here in Dublin. And we have then uh, Orna O'Brien, who is a registered dietitian with the Irish Heart Foundation. So they are all of our panelists here today, and we will be putting a spotlight on all areas of women's health. So whatever stage you are at in life, um, we are going to deal with it today. We are, of course, talking about heart disease and stroke, the impact that menopause has on your heart health, and also what questions should women uh, ask their healthcare providers. Of course, we all have very busy lives, and what small, maybe sustainable changes we can make in our lives to help our heart health. So before we get into the conversation, you can uh, join us online. We'd love to know if you're being part of this great uh, webinar today. And the hashtag is Her Heart Matters. I know thousands of you have signed up to the webinar, so we're very, very happy with that. Um, we're going to play a little video first, and this is about Her Heart Matters campaign. Let's take a look. There's a false belief that heart disease and stroke is a man's disease, when in fact there are many women-specific factors so what happens is as you age through your ovarian lifespan and your estrogen levels start to drop, you lose the cardiac protection. 80% of premature heart disease and stroke is preventable through healthy lifestyles. Mind yourself, look after your heart. Join the Her Heart Matters movement. See irishheart.ie. So as you can see from the message there, uh, lots of advice, lots of tips. We're going to deal with that, but also how you can prevent heart disease and stroke. So we'd like you to take part in a poll because we really want you to be very interactive in this webinar and tell us exactly what you want to talk about. So uh, we are going to put it on screen now in the poll and uh, you can discuss menopause and cardiovascular health, uh, how to make lifestyle changes like eating healthier, how to look after your mental health and manage stress, and hearing about real women's experiences. So pick just one which you would like to discuss, and you have 40 seconds to, to choose that one now. And then I will tell you which one that uh, is being most impacted from the beginning here, but we will discuss all of them. So let us talk first uh, to Maura Canning. And uh, Maura, you're the real life person among us. You are, I suppose, the statistic here today. Yes. Tell us your story. You're almost atypical of somebody, especially for myself, that would think that would have high blood pressure. How did it happen? Um, I was working down in the Agricultural Women's Conference and that happens every year in an October time of the year, which is around about now. And in the evening time, the Irish Heart Foundation had their nurses station there all day. And by the time I finished um, that evening, um, there was maybe 10 or 12 of us left after work. And I just decided to go in and get my blood pressure checked. And some of them said to me, Maura, what are you doing going in there? And on the offset of that, um, the blood pressure had been very high. And uh, they told me that I sh needed to go home and go to the doctor, which I didn't do. That's kind of a woman's thing. <laughs> and I went to the doctor um, a few days later and he said, Maury, your blood pressure is very high. He said, you really need to kind of keep an eye on this. Come back to me in a few days. But I didn't do that. I bought a blood pressure monitor by the following weekend, which was the space of seven days. And I watched the blood pressure get higher and higher at the weekend. <coughs> I was at a wedding, actually, and I left the wedding and I went to Banislow to a casualty. And the minute they wired me up and they checked the blood pressure, which the first thing would be done when you go into casualty in Port Yonkla and Banislow, and she said, you're going nowhere. And I said, how high is this now? Your blood pressure, just for people that's online, is 120 over 80. Mine was 226 over 118. 
My goodness, so that's he was very a lucky high. woman. You were very young. You're 52 now, but yeah. this happened when you were what age? Uh, 40. That yeah. seems unusual. I might yeah. go to our panellists on this. And uh, Nicola, I might come to you first, of course, Dr. Dr. Nicola Corcoran, GP. Um, it <coughs> seems very high to me. And it seems unusual that a woman of that age, who was, f number one, working in the area of farming, yeah. very fit, not overweight. Yes, and very much in the area of who has very much lifestyle. We're going to be thinking about a lot of different things. So we're thinking about family history, first of all. Is this something that other family members have? But we're also thinking about any other medical problems that could be contributing to a high blood pressure. Um, and it needs an awful lot of investigation to have a bit of clarity on whether there are other aspects to someone's health apart from high blood pressure. But what we're increasingly aware of now is that sometimes we get little clues earlier in life when we're having our children, women who have high blood pressure in pregnancy, women who develop diabetes in pregnancy, women who have premature deliveries, um, are all women who are more at risk of developing high blood pressure or heart disease later in life. And they might be, in every other way, very, very healthy people, um, but it's an indicator that they might have trouble later on. Yeah, I was chatting uh, with Maura here, thank you, Leanne, it just before we came on here, and one of the questions I asked her was, did you have symptoms? And you didn't have symptoms, no. but she described kind of a wish or a feeling. Mm -hmm. So uh, can we talk a little bit about this? Because w as I've kind of been going through this month and learning a little bit more about women's health and women's heart health, I've noticed that women's symptoms when it comes to heart disease and stroke can be very different or not there at all. Yes. Um, a lot of women will not have conventional central chest pain if they have heart mm. disease like angina, um, but they'll often feel tired and um, more breathless. With blood pressure, it's very interesting. Some people will equate that to almost like a brain fog. They will have headaches, you know, a sense of just everything being more of an effort um, and taking a toll on them. But they're not the kind of extreme symptoms that you would consider calling an ambulance or that you would mm. necessarily realize I ought to get my health checked. Mm. Um, and there's an, an incredible tendency for women to think, oh, well, if I were just a bit more active and if I were a bit more healthy, then maybe I'd have more energy and I would feel better. So the default is to think that they should be doing something different rather than realizing that this may be a health condition that is contributing to their symptoms. Mm. Mm. So the whole thing is not taking it the next step like you mm. didn't go to the doctor Maura so you kind of waited and even when somebody said or they said in the mobile unit that your heart or your blood pressure, pressure was a bit off you still didn't take mm. that so I guess it's taking that step as Nicola yeah. said and um, Orna can I come to you just on lifestyle factors and thank you all so much for joining in and also voting in such numbers here to tell us about what you want to hear about in our poll top is menopause and cardiovascular disease I'm going to come back to you Nicola on that but I want and second you want to talk about how to make lifestyle changes like eating healthier so this relates to you Maura mm. Orna small steps baby steps sustainable realistic steps when it comes to changing what we eat that can help us Yes, so I think when it comes to diet and lifestyle, there's a, a huge focus on, you know, this ideal that we see on social media of, you know, clean eating, low fat, low carb, <laughs> this, and, and, you know, what do I need to cut out? And this very kind of exclusion focused way of approaching diet, I think a, a more important question to, ans to ask is, am I including all the foods that I need to be uh, including to fuel my body now and also to protect my you know my heart health my bone health all of that um so honestly you know the the heart healthiest diet that we know of is actually not a low fat diet at all it's the mediterranean diet we know for women in particular there's a huge study that came out last year um looked at over 7000 women over 12 and a half years they found that a lower risk of heart disease stroke and all causes of death related to the Mediterranean diet. So it's hugely impactful. And in terms of you know practical practicalities, how do we translate that into everyday eating and drinking? Honestly, I would start with a balanced plate. So what I mean by that is half your plate, fruit, veg, salad, a quarter carbs, so your starchy carbs, and a quarter protein. And I know you've probably heard that before, but I, I promise you it works. And, and even if you don't get that perfect model plate every time even moving a little bit 
more towards that every time you, you eat will bring you more towards that ratio. And if you do that three times a day, you know, and, and have a glass of water or some kind of sugar-free drink, milk, tea, coffee, whatever, three times a day, um, that's honestly 90% of the work. Yeah, it just shows you really, we, I'm sure a lot of us and a lot of you joining us today have watched uh, The Blue Zones on Netflix. Mm -hmm. And if you haven't, there are various places in the world like Okinawa in Japan, uh, Sardinia in Italy, uh, Paraguay in South America. And these places are almost very, very different to a lot of the world in the sense that people lived not just the octogenarians, but a lot further on as well into their 90s and even over 100. And what's amazing about that is that a lot of them have that balanced or, no, or Mediterranean diet, but also the balanced diet and plant-based. In this country, I feel we pile up the plate with a meat. You know, we put the emphasis on the steak. Or <laughs> but seriously, I think it's maybe so many years of maybe not having a lot of, mm. of good things to yeah. eat in our diet or not being able to afford, you know, certain meats and all that, that people now have <coughs> gone the other way. Right. So we're putting emphasis on meats instead of looking at the plate of, as you said, vegetables and, and good, you know, fiber and good carbohydrates like potatoes and sweet potatoes. Is that yeah. right? And I should clarify, by Mediterranean diet, I don't mean you know, spaghetti and wine. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> like fruit, vegetables, whole grains, yeah. peas, beans, lentils, um, and then some, you know, poultry, some dairy products, some seafood, some olive oil. And it's, as you said, it's generally low in meat, um, low in ultra processed foods. But when it comes to the protein side of things and, and, and meat, yes, we do tend to over consume um, meat in this country, more so the men than the women, I'd say. Oh, um, but still including protein at all of your meals really really important especially for women as we any woman over 30 really because after 30 which i think is horrifyingly too young for this to be happening but we start to lose muscle mass yeah. we start to lose um, bone density and our muscles and our bones need to be fed every three to five hours or so so making sure you're including protein with your meals but making sure that there's a bit more balance in the place so over the week you know fish twice a week if you can, once oily fish like salmon. Um, some red meat is okay. I think there's a lot of debate over, mm -hmm. over the red meat side of things. Two to three portions yeah. max in the week, I'd say, and try to minimize the unprocessed um, meats. And then, uh, as you said, more beans, peas, lentils, trying to get those proteins in there that are also high in fiber and other nutrients as well. And you can do this as well. I guess when you talk about lentils or legumes, y you know, they're quite cheap. So it doesn't have to be very expensive to have these diets. Often people think it'll cost an awful lot for me to have this perfect diet. Or no, that is not the case. It's a, it's a tricky question because it is and it isn't. So we know that some of the ultra processed food that's out there that is um, high in fat, sugar, salt, <coughs> etc is three times cheaper calorie per calorie than um, the healthier alternatives. So, you know, from an overall society point of view, you know, we are being bombarded with these messages to consume these kind of foods. But at the same time, um, there's ways you can trick the system, I guess. So when it comes to your plant-based proteins, uh, your, your beans, your lentils, especially the tins and the dry stuff, mm. really, really cheap. Your, um, Nuts and seeds are always going to be a bit more expensive. What about potatoes, a basic Irish staple? And yeah. they're, they're very good and nutritious, aren't they? Absolutely, and especially if you keep the skins on them. So mm. um, really good, yeah, staple Irish, you know, it's, it's in us <laughs> to, to love potatoes. And it's around us. Yeah. And it's easy, yeah. Thanks. Um, I want to come to Dr. Samantha Docker, who is senior lecturer in the School of Applied Psychology at uh, UCC. Samantha, one of the questions in here is, well, the top question that uh, people want to discuss from our poll is menopause and menopausal health. And let's talk about our mind and how the menopause affects us. Because I don't know if we realized mm. until the conversation on the menopause almost feels like just began a few years ago. Mm. Um, that can bring a lot of stress into our lives at a certain point. I think it can. I think uh, one you're right in saying like it feels like we've just started talking about it and it was kind of a hidden conversation. But as we bring our attention to it, we might think about when we are feeling the stress, when we're f having trouble, trouble regulating our emotions, which is, can happen through in perimenopause and menopause itself once it's complete, we think about, well, what else is going on? So I think it serves as a really good signal to us to take a moment of reflection. So how might this be a turning point for me? 
you know, we think about menopause as occurring over years and so to describe it as a turning point might be a bit odd, but it's a time when we are drawn, our attention is drawn to our body and thinking about, well, how is what's going on in my body? How is that shaping my feelings and how am I feeling shaping what's going on in the body? I think it serves as a really crucial, important time and a great conversation to be thinking, what can I do now for okay. myself? And would you recommend that people pay particular attention to their mental health around the menopause and also what they can do and would you think a meditation or almost a bit of yoga or something like that would that be very helpful that we actually need to take care of our mental health as well as our physical health when it comes to our heart health yeah absolutely i mean our mental health has direct links to our physical health we know that when we're feeling stressed whether that's because of our daily time demands pressures or big life events that we know that that is going to have a direct contribution to our cardiovascular health our risk of diabetes weight gain body shape changes all of those things but how do we deal with that because it can become one more pressure how do i have this perfect stress-free life how do i become someone who practices mindfulness and that's one of the challenges that i think many people listening and watching today will probably come at well, how do i build that in and it's very small things so do i develop a practice of you know, five days a week doing something? Or do I think about how can I build in the small moments mm. where I prioritise myself? How do I identify the areas of my life where I can't sta start saying, no, I can't take that on. My plate is full enough. Mm. I have as much as I can handle and I can't do that right now. Yeah. Learning to say no sometimes it's too. Cr critically important. And, you know, we're looking out the window here uh, in, in Meta HQ in Dublin and we can see beautiful greenery. And I know that walking even for 10 minutes in mm -hmm. green spaces can actually elevate your mental health, and also release dopamine. So there's this natural high you get from nature. So maybe you start with a, a daily 10-minute walk even. Yeah, and this can happen. There's some really interesting work that looks at whether or not you have to be in nature or whether, you know, what, what is enough nature, what is enough green yeah. space or blue space and the idea of being near water. It's critically important. People can do that whether they live in a very kind of urban area without perhaps a lot of <laughs> green space by looking at pictures. So not everyone is able to get up and get out and move around in their neighbourhood or their neighbourhood may not have a lot of green space. So we can think about what can you do to look at pictures of green space. You know, sometimes those, um, you see them on, you know, online, you can look, go through these walks yeah. through the forest um, and they're virtual walks and That's they can really have some benefit as well. Yeah, so if you are housebound, if you can't physically work, I think that's really interesting that yeah. that can actually elevate your brain, a sense, and produce dopamine and happy hormones. Yeah. That, that's really good yeah. to know. Nicola, I'm going to come to you because, of course, mm -hmm. you, you're a specialist in menopausal health uh, and a GP as well. And again, the top question, surprise, surprise, from mm -hmm. women watching this today are menopause and cardiovascular disease. They want to talk yeah. about that. So can we talk about menopause, the effects it has on cardiovascular disease? Yeah. And we need to think about everything about estrogen, which is so valuable to us. Um, all through our young adult lives, estrogen has been protecting our health. It protects our cardiovascular system. It keeps our blood vessels clear. It gives us energy and well-being so that we're much more likely to be active. At menopause, when your estrogen drops, um, huge changes occur in your metabolism. So. Amongst other things, your cholesterol starts to rise, your blood pressure rises, you deposit more adipose tissue, more fat, um, you become frustratingly insulin resistant, um, and at the same time as that, you, you derive a huge appetite for refined sugar. So the very foods that your body actually isn't able to digest is what your brain is telling you you want. Um, so Whenever we have women that are moving into the perimenopause as their estrogen is becoming more volatile and those changes are beginning, that is the time that we would really encourage women. This is time to take stock and look at your individual health, your family, um, what personal choices you've made that could contribute to your heart health. Do you smoke? Do you not smoke? Are you reasonably active? Um, and then going to um, a clinic for simple checks, cholesterol, blood pressure, maybe a body mass index to record your weight and height, can give a huge amount of information on whether there is work to be done in protecting your heart health. How, da so can I ask, how dangerous is visceral fat around your stomach yeah. as you go into menopause and relatability to heart health? It's significantly different because when you think about it, that fat is depositing around vital organs one of which, of course, is your heart, your liver, your kidneys. 
So whenever we see that change in our body shape, that's also reflecting a substantial increased risk to our health and well-being from those very changes that uh, we haven't necessarily had any control over. That insulin or that estrogen is dropping off and those processes have begun. Um, and it's time then for women to consider. Certainly we would encourage more really driven by symptoms of menopause, but second to that, the benefit that you're going to get in protecting your health by taking hormonal therapy um, is really substantial. Um, so we see changes in blood vessels, we see softening of cholesterol deposits and a protection of the lining of your arteries so that you can effectively kick that can down the road. So you're, you're maintaining your estrogen advantage throughout the time that you use hormonal therapy. And most of the studies would suggest that if women use hormonal therapy up until about the age of 60, that they will protect themselves from heart disease and stroke. It's interesting because I always think there's such a blurred area of perimenopause and menopause. And I think women are still quite confused <laughs> as mm. to where they are and when it starts and finishes. I mean, yeah. how early can perimenopause begin, Nicola? Well, what's important to know is that perimenopause describes a phase of your life when you're starting to notice a change in your well-being, even though you may still have a regular menstrual cycle. Um, and if you did hormone blood tests, they wouldn't necessarily give you any measure of where you are, um, but women know how they feel. So when you know that your sleep is disturbed, that your sense of equilibrium, your well-being, maybe anxiety levels are changing, um, a lot of interestingly higher executive function, list making tasks, completing tasks. So I would often talk to women about the fact that the anxiety and the stress that they experience during menopause is often driven a lot by uh, indecisiveness. So you keep hovering ideas that you haven't quite concluded. You haven't made a plan or made a decision, yes or no, on um, a, an, an action that you're potentially going to take. So you've got all of this unfinished business going around in your brain. And that's incredibly distracting. Women in a modern world have very, very busy lives. They have a lot of responsibilities. Many, many women are working mothers, so they're juggling lots of plates. Um, and trying to get from one end of the day to the other becomes incredibly difficult. Mm. Orna was uh, discussing there that you know it's important to eat fish two or three times a week if you can, and, and of course for your heart health. But also, what do you think about supplements? What is your own view? Can we? Do you believe we should take some su supplements? Should we take maybe you know if we're not getting a great diet? Do you think Nicola that maybe taking um, vitamins or fish oils or can that help? Or eating primrose oil or? or Probably the most important thing if you want to protect your bones is to take vitamin D3. Yeah. So there's very large bodies of evidence to suggest, particularly living in Ireland, we will not get enough vitamin D from sunlight from October through to March, um, even if we were outside naked every day. Yeah. Um, it just, <laughs> we would Running not absorb. Running around, not yeah. this country, it's yeah, so cold. We would it, it's impossible. So taking a vitamin D supplement is well evidenced. Um, there's a lot of controversy on the fish oil supplement, so people are quite keen to take those. But they did some really good studies in England um, based on heart health, cholesterol, and cardiovascular disease. And they took a cohort and left them making no change to their diet. Um, one third took fish oil supplements, and the other third followed a Mediterranean diet with oily fish. And the only group that derived any benefit were the group that ate the oily fish. Mm. So it was disappointing to see that the fish oil supplements did not translate into an improvement yeah. or a protection. I suppose, Orna, the reality is if we can get the vitamins from our foods, that's the best. I suppose that is the best way. When it comes to fish, uh, oily fish, yes, that's definitely the case. When it comes to vitamin D, uh, I fully agree with you, mm. Nicola, that th in Ireland, you know, with our awful sunlight <laughs> and um, poor vitamin D <laughs> sources from food, the, the most straightforward way is to kind of forget about the sunlight and just go with vitamin D supplement. And also, just while we're on supplements, you know, around menopause, that can be an incredibly targeting time for women. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sponsored ads online saying, you know, this supplement, this supplement to mm -hmm. cure all ails when it comes to menopause symptoms and, um, and even, you know, nutrition and diet side of things. But there's very, very poor evidence for really anything else apart from the vitamin um, D. Another, oh, the only one I'd, uh, I'd also kind of consider from a dietary point of view is that if you're 
um, plant-based or you know vegetarian or yes. vegan and you don't particularly you don't have a good dairy intake um, then vitamin B12 is some one to watch out for as well. Yeah, that, that's probably very important it is if you don't eat meat, isn't it? Mm. Maura, as the, the real person here, beside <laughs> myself, <laughs> all these experts, how were you with your diet and all that before you realised you had high blood pressure? Um, I would have had a good diet because I wasn't a robot eater. Yeah. And they mentioned the supplements there and it's only, <coughs> excuse me, during COVID or pre-COVID, I started taking various different supplements in the last five years and I... I believe it, that it has helped, even though the best way is to get the vitamins from the food. But I just believe that it has helped me. Yeah. But diet wise, I would always have been a good eater and I suppose a meat eater because being on a farm of course. and maybe you have too much protein. You've, you're trying to get the balance now because I now realize 10 years on that, you know, you ha as you get older, your body changes. There's menopause, there's all these things because I had um, the various checks done from kidney to hormone to all of them things and there was an unbalance there and things. Yeah. So maybe that was, but as time has gone on, because now it could have been genetic because my dad got a heart attack two years ago. So you see, and as as it stands at the minute, six months ago or four months ago when I did uh, blood pressure and um, which I keep a regular check in it. And that's why I'd say to women that are even online today, Make sure and go and do it every few months because it's so important. You will walk, like I was walking around, I was like a ticking time bomb, as the media put it. Mm. I didn't know. I had no symptoms. My symptoms were tiredness, which you mentioned there earlier on, as one of the doctors mentioned there, and also tiredness during the day, but to stay going, which is not a good thing to do. But now I'd like to adhere to women to realize that if they're very tired during the day, that this may be a symptom. Or if you go into the bathroom and you turn on a tap, this is the only way I can explain it. The flow and sensation I had in my head five, six months prior. So there was a build up there that I didn't realize. You felt something was going I on in your This body. was at night. You know, I could feel this flowing sensation. So when I had the doctors around the bed, when I went into casualty, as I was explaining there a few minutes ago, that's when they said, have you any s symptoms? And I said, no. I said, I have no symptoms. And then I thought, and I said, yeah, I have this flow and sensation. But the flow and sensation was the blood going from the heart to the brain as fast as it could. And they said that I was fit enough to take it, that I just didn't get a heart attack. And that was down to a bit of dancing that I was doing in between. The dancing family is good. <laughs> Seriously, Family <laughs> life and, yeah, yeah. you know, the usual daily chores of a mother and a carer or whatever the case may be and you just stay going you don't you don't bother going to the doctor you're kind of thinking you you're okay but you're not do you know what that's really interesting even what you say there are so many women all of us just no. keep going because you just stay going and we don't even know we're going i mean i'm one myself i'm just going like a little bit of a robot the whole time and i mean i'm almost in overdrive and i'm so sure i am in overdrive blood pressure yeah i know that's the thing see. you see and it, you know all <laughs> when you think about it um you're you're just consistently trucking along, whether it's kids yeah. or husbands or partners, or whatever, and you kind of don't think of yourself, and you feel like you, Maura. You felt I'm grand, and that's oh. the worst thing you could say is you think you're grand oh every minute. Just uh, from a psychological point mm. of view as well, I suppose you you said you need to think of of yourself. I mean, do you, you think women need to actually put time aside to think for themselves, almost yeah. force themselves into that? I think many of us need to be retrained to do that. Yes. Most yeah. of us get trained to think of other people first and yeah. and to make all those accommodations. You know, sometimes the way you're talking there, I think, oh, and you're responsible for this person and this person <laughs> and this person <laughs> and making sure this gets done and this gets done and this gets done. And where would you say what would you say to your friend? Like where where are you in all of this? How do you how do you put yourself first? Many of us need to learn to do that. It can be very effortful, but yeah. if we don't, what we're saying is that we're of no value, you know, that we don't become prioritised or we, we discount our own needs, you know, the feeling <coughs> of that rushingness that you talk about. Yep. Many of us would hear that and think like, oh, I may have felt things like that and I discount them and I think it's you just did, yeah. because I feel stressed, it's because I've got so much on, I'll deal with that in the future. Yeah. The time is now, like you think, what can I do now? These and are the signals. Nicola was saying that, you know, how women, you know, the menopause can make you almost that confused mm. feeling. Uh, have yeah. you realize that through your career that women are like that almost overloaded and and oh, there's a fear that can be kick, can kick into your head because you don't know you don't know what's happening to you 
Yeah, you don't know it or you make up explanations for it to do with, you know, having lots on or this or that or the other. And and it is a fear and I think one of the things that we would understand in health psychology is that it's not that people don't feel the signals but they discount them because to deal with them means making a change of some kind and that can be con difficult and it can be scary. It can be scary to go and have your blood pressure taken and thinking, walking in thinking, I'll just do it for the laughs or I'll just do a check and walking out with go and see your GP, and um, it's a fear-based response. Okay, it's interesting, and I'd like to hear a little bit more about that type of research of how we process, uh, and how we process, especially as we maybe get older, mm. and I suppose from, you know, t your 20s, you're fairly free, a lot of people are, and then you're into your 30s. Do you think that we process differently as we get older? Absolutely. I mean, part of it's just driven by the accumulation of life experiences, and we get better at identifying things. But... Often we get more demands. You know, I think of people that I have contact with who are in their 20s, and it's not to say they don't have a lot of things going on in their life. They have a lot of responsibilities. They're attending to a lot of things. But as we go on in life, they accumulate. So many of us, you know, uh, you know, particularly who are in that menopausal stage, have caregiving responsibilities to people who are older and people who are younger. Mm. And, and those caregiving responsibilities can take up a lot of time and emotional kind of perspective that we have. I think th when we think about the behaviour changes, you know, the diet and the movement and being attentive to those things, we have to also be attentive to the emotional content of our lives. Mm. Emotions have a direct link to our health, you know, very direct biological link. And, and when we start thinking and reflecting upon that, it can be a very challenging thing to do. But in the middle of our lives, it's, it's not only necessary, but we, many, most of us would have the tools to do it. How do I think about myself? How do I understand my emotions? How can I understand myself better to have a better life? Mm. When you think about emotions, you know, young children at school these days, my son is nine, and, you know, it's a very open society now compared to when I was at school, mm. and emotions are talked about all the time, which I think is really, really good. Mm. And I didn't even realise the spectrum of emotions. I keep seeing all these <laughs> new emotions. I didn't even know they were there. <laughs> but I mean, we are discussing this and children are not very aware. There's, there's, there's mm. a whole spectrum of emotions out there. For us that are a bit older, do you think we need to relearn emotions? Is that possible? Absolutely, it's possible. Absolutely, it's possible. And um, I think that's really interesting when we talk about this, this whole spectrum of emotions. And in psychology, when we ask people how they're feeling, they have like five stock responses. Yeah. And it's like, I'm happy, I'm stressed, I'm worried, do you know. And, and that's a bit of a shorthand language we use to identify it. And then we say, well, what's the difference between feeling stressed and feeling anxious? What's the difference between feeling joyful and feeling triumphant? Many of us don't have that language, in part because we, we like, you know, by nature, many of us use shorthand to think about things, to it's more efficient. Um, but reflecting upon what is going on for me now, okay. what is this emotion? We, we can learn it. Okay, but it's I'm going to ask you now, because I think I'm equally stressed and anxious together sometimes. What is the difference between being stressed and anxious? And is a certain amount of stress good for you? Because I know as a person, I'm like, really a high dough person at all times. I work on TV. I feel mm -hmm. it's good for me. It nearly feeds into my needs, you know, when, when I'm on television that I need to be ready almost. Yep. I've yeah. been chased by a dinosaur every day, okay, <laughs> in live television or live radio or whatever. But then is there that fine line where your natural kind of high can be compromised if anxiety overtakes that? Can you explain mm. a little? Because I know there are people today uh, listening to us and watching and saying, you know what? Where am I in this spectrum of emotion? And what's a bad one and what's a good one? What's normal? Well, I think about stress as being under pressure. And stress is our signal to change what we're doing, change where we are, change how we're managing something, get out of the situation. It's this signal we get that this ain't right. Okay. You know, What you're describing is kind of you stress, powerful stress, positive stress that gets us up, gets us going. We need that as well. It's when we have too much of the other that you know we, we have some difficult consequences. We tend to characterise anxiety as patterns of thoughts that bring our worries to the fore. Um, and sometimes, you know, for some people, they have difficulty managing those because they can become, you know, they come up a lot and they're ways of being. But stress is the pressures put upon us. Our anxiety is part of how we manage that. And, and when you talk about, like, some of our stress comes from not making the decision, not being able to move on, you know, thinking about how do I get myself out of this situation? How do I change this feeling? How do I change this stress? Mm. We often hear these days, Nicola, that stress is a killer. Can stress, in your opinion, yeah. lead, lead to 
a stroke lead yeah. to other issues? Can it? Yeah. Let's well let's put it let's put a spotlight on stress because I think it's huge in our society. It's now been included as a risk factor for heart disease and stroke by the European Society of Cardiology. So when we look at different aspects of someone's life and what could contribute extra risk to heart disease, stress is there. Um, and th that's very new, and that's the first time they've brought it in. And under that section of stress, they included socioeconomic things, mm -hmm. so people struggling with financial pressures, people living in difficult home circumstances or environments, as well as family pressures or relationship crises. So all of that creates a burden of stress. And we know effectively, physically, that high adrenaline that you're experiencing whenever you're suffering from stress is damaging to your circulation. What happens to your body when you release hormones, when you're in stress, that fight or flight? And if you're stressed too much, what pressure does that put on you? Well, probably the first thing that's going to happen in a situation like that is that your heart rate is going to be faster. Okay. And your blood pressure, if you measured it, um, would be a little bit higher. And that would vary from one individual to another. Um, what's very interesting in a menopause context is they've done some very, very detailed studies on the experience of women having hot flushes. Um, and what we know is that during a hot flush, if you're monitoring someone's blood pressure, the woman's blood pressure will be much higher while she's experiencing the hot flush. Um, so there's now a very direct correlation between women who suffer much more severe hot flushes and sweats and risk of heart disease and blood pressure. Um, so we're trying as much as possible to encourage women to think about that and to come into their doctors for checkups so that it's not at all a appropriate to suggest to someone, oh, just use a fan or try and cool down, is that that's an indication that your body's suffering from a physical insult that could be really quite dangerous. So I didn't realize that. I don't know if people watching us today realize that either yeah. because when you think of menopause for years the mm -hmm. only symptom like say my mother would have said or mm -hmm. you know older people would have said a hot flush yeah so it can actually be dangerous for your physical Absolutely. for your heart yeah. health so when we look at groups of women who are much more likely to experience much more severe hot flushes severe and night yeah sweats, i get it yeah they would be women who have higher risks of heart mm -hmm. disease and some of them when you do the investigations they have already got um, cholesterol deposits in their arteries and um, they've got little narrowings and they might have high blood pressure. When you go to a GP, um, you should be open about all these and then they can maybe have a plan for you to take therapy, as you said, hormonal mm. replacement therapy or give you a plan. So how, how important is it? I mean, we talked to more here about this to, to explain each symptom individually and or GPs equipped? Uh, you are, obviously, yeah. but are most GPs equipped now, do you feel? Absolutely. And I mean, I would be involved with a lot of other menopause specialists in providing education for GPs and the appetite for education in rela relation to menopause and menopausal heart health is enormous amongst our Irish GPs. So I feel that they're a group of very, very well-informed health professionals um, and they really do welcome the opportunity um, to provide care for women at this time in menopause. Um, I think it's interesting if you compare it to breast health and breast awareness. We've got a national breast screening program that we're all invited to when we're 50, um, and then we get follow-up breast screening. Mm -hmm. But one in four um, Irish women are going to die from heart disease, and we don't have any national heart screening program. It would seem very, very logical to offer women um, a health screen um, for some a few simple things, their blood pressure, their cholesterol, mm -hmm. and their body mass index, mm -hmm. somewhere between 40 and 45, so that we can get, a, get in ahead of damage mm -hmm. occurring yeah, and identify the women that are most at risk. That sounds very practical. It sounds like a practical thing to do, but the fact that we don't have this national screening right now, I suppose it's upon each of us as women to go yes. and say, you know what, can you uh, walk into your GP and say, look, I'm not feeling great. Can you take my blood pressure? Mm -hmm. Can you check my heart? Maybe have your blood done. How important it is to have your ha having your blood done as we get older? I think to have them done at least once. If you imagine, certainly at the outset of menopause, your cholesterol is going to be changing. So you might have had it done at some stage, maybe through an occupational health mm -hmm. screen or something like that, and it could have been okay in your 30s. But in your mid-40s, you'll already see changes in your cholesterol. So depending on your, your family and your family risk, that could already be very high and it would need to be addressed. 
Um, and that, that's something where we very much encourage people to go and follow their Mediterranean diet for six months, then come back, yeah. measure, see what we've achieved with that. Um, if it's not um, improving in any significant way, that's an indicator, and particularly as well balanced with someone describing other members of their family that have had a diagnosis of heart disease or high blood pressure. Uh, for um, women under the age of 60 or for men under the age of 65, we would consider that very significant. And so the advice we'd give them on managing their cholesterol would be different to somebody where no one in the family suffers from heart disease. Mm -hmm. So if I went to you with cholesterol of, say, six, uh, it, let's just say high seven, mm -hmm. you'd say, OK, maybe try and get it down yourself with diet mm -hmm. and exercise. But then after a certain point, you feel, take a statin. Mm -hmm. Putting it into context with those other factors. With the so other factors. So your family history, mm -hmm. whether you smoke, whether you're diabetic, and what your blood pressure is right now, mm -hmm. um, and what your body mass index is, mm -hmm. and your life stress. Yeah, so there's so a lot to be, Orna, there's a lot to be considered, isn't there? So if mm -hmm. somebody came to you from Nicola, mm -hmm. let's just say, for example, I mean, what would be the first thing you'd say to them to do to get their, their cholesterol down? Yeah, so we would obviously start with the basics, the fundamentals that I talked about earlier, yeah. the, the balance of fate. But also, if we really want to tackle lowering your cholesterol, um, one of the big things I look at is heart healthy swaps. So um, that could be, let's say, butter on bread, for example. Can you switch that to mm. you know, hummus, avocado, low fat spread? I know that's not for everybody, so we have lots of options. Olive tapenade, pesto, and nut butter. There's loads of options out there. It doesn't have to be um, you know, just, just the, the low fat spreads. When it comes to frying foods in a pan instead of olive oil or, or instead of coconut oil uh, or butter, could mm -hmm. you use olive oil, rapeseed oil, or some kind of fat-free cooking methods? And then there's also certain foods that we can add in that will help to lower your cholesterol. So we call these functional foods. So one of them would be oats and barley. So it has a sticky fiber in it called beta-glucan and having lots of oats and barley throughout your day can actually lower your cholesterol. Like porridge in the morning? Porridge in the morning, porridge bread, um, overnight oats, um, even you know barley and stews that you have yeah. throughout the day, granola bars. You know, so there's, there's lots of ways you can pack in the, um, the oats. So that's, that's one way you can do it. It'll lower your cholesterol by about 3 to 10%. That's great. Nuts as well, a great one. So a handful of nuts, such an easy change to make, but a handful of un un unsalted nuts once a day will lower your cholesterol, your LDL cholesterol, which is your bad cholesterol, by about 3 to 5%. Then there's also other ways we can go about it, looking at plant stanols or sterols, the kind of yogurt drinks that you might take to lower your cholesterol. And also um, there is uh, soya foods as well. So also you know, popular around, you, you hear people talking about it in regards to menopause as well, but we know that from cholesterol point of view, including soya-based foods like tofu, soy milk, soy yogurt, edamame beans, uh, on a regular basis can reduce your cholesterol by 4%. So not just, you know, cutting foods out, but it's like, what, what can we add in as well? And then also for the, the big elephant in the room, the, you know, chocolates and sweets and the crisps so all these you know packaged ultra processed foods what we call them sometimes um, I actually think the best you know there's no point in saying to someone just just try to eat a little bit less of them because yeah. you know God knows like <laughs> we know that already you know it's yeah. nothing new and Nicola said I mean you know you're, pr you're almost like you want more of those things around the menopause because mm. your hormones yeah. fluctuate mm. so what do you do looking at me now what do I do because I would have a really sweet tooth I've always had a sweet tooth I'd, I'd struggle I, I I really kind of yearn for sweet things like chocolates and all that. It's just the way it is. I think that the most effective way to approach that is to actually unpack that as a habit loop. So think of it as um, every, this, let's say your behavior is the, you know, the eating of the bar of chocolate, yes. let's say. What has triggered you to do that? Is it, you know, is it that you're busy, you're stressed, yeah. you're tired? What's going on? There's always a trigger to a behavior. So un just taking a bit of time out to, to mm -hmm. unpack that and then you can kind of write out the result of that as well so in the short term you know pleasure it's uh, enjoyable to eat you know fullness y you feel great after it sometimes but long term you know weight <laughs> gain high cholesterol mm. blood pressure that kind of thing and in our um our 
Her Heart Matters self-care and well-being journal, we actually have these habit loops mapped out. So you can take any habit that you have, but it, I think it's particularly helpful for, you know, the, the chocolates, the sweets, and you can just explore it by yourself and figure out what the triggers are for you. It really helps you to see, okay, actually, you know, I was doing quite well, but things fell apart for me when I was just really stressed or really tired. What about substitute? I mean, I always feel if you give up something you like, you have to have something else. I mean, is there, like, if I'm not going to have my chocolate bar, what can I have? So mm. it's a balance between having, you know, not demonizing things altogether. Yes. So a little bit of everything is fine, but having, I guess, healthy snacks that are around you that you're actually going to enjoy. Yeah. Because honestly, you know, if somebody says, instead of that bar of chocolate, why won't you have a nice it. apple? That is not going to do it for me. <laughs> you know, I need to have something that I'm going <laughs> to actually enjoy. So think about what that would actually look like thing. for you. Yeah. Some, yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, something that that's enjoyable for you. So that might be, uh, you know, dark chocolate, maybe. D yeah. I mean, dark chocolate yeah. is an interesting one. Actually, uh, we know it's really high in flavonoids, which actually help to bring down your blood pressure. So square two of that mm. is um, it's actually a great um, alternative to the, the milk chocolate. But, you know, anything, I, I would question, you know, if you're really hungry between a lot of meal times as well, are you eating enough at meal times? Is it balanced enough? Are you getting enough protein? Are you getting, an, are you fueling your body with starchy carbs as well? So making sure you're eating enough at your meal times is automatically going to make you want to um, uh, snack, great, snack a little yeah. bit less. That's so true. Yeah. It, and it is eating enough of the right things. And I find sometimes when I'm rushing, and I'm sure all of us are the same, true, true. that you just kind of grab something and then, and then you almost eat something you shouldn't eat because you're rushing away. Mm -hmm. I should say as well, our signers are here uh, today as well. So as you're joining us, um, we have our signers uh, talking through everything. Our two sign language um, interpreters, Margaret Wolf, and we have Michael Feeney as well. But of course, you're very welcome to get in touch with us uh, on Instagram and also on Twitter. And on Instagram, it's at Irish Heart and the Irish Heart Foundation on Twitter and send us a message. We'll try and get them in as well. So I think we're talking about breaking habits. We're talking about, and I think that's very, very useful, Orna, is what you can put in to help you. And I like that idea of eating foods that's going to lower my cholesterol and giving it that little bit of time before you might have to take medication. Um, Nicola, can everyone take hormone replacement therapy? Uh, almost everyone. Um, so the most critically important group of women that we would encourage to avoid hormone replacement therapy would be anyone with a hormone receptor positive cancer. Um, the heart um, aspects of hormonal therapy are complicated. Um, so where we know that HRT is very heart protective, there's a timing which is critical. And that's why we'd love women to come in as young as possible, because if you start estrogen at the outset of your menopause, you can protect yourself and delay heart disease from evolving. But in women who have already got well-established heart disease, if they've had a heart attack already, if they've had a stroke, the aspects of estrogen become a lot more complicated. Most of the guidelines will say that it would not be wise to start it. In our complex menopause clinic, I will say that we do start it, but we're following very careful pathways in introducing estrogen for those women very, very slowly and gently, and always transdermally. Um, but if you're visualizing the inside of your blood vessels, whenever they don't have cholesterol deposits in them, they're rich in estrogen receptors. So you put estrogen into that environment and it maintains it and it keeps it lovely and clear and everything flows. Once that blood vessel has already got fatty deposits of cholesterol in it, they're obstructing the estrogen receptors. So when you put estrogen into that environment, it could be dangerous. Mm -hmm. So it's not very simple, and it has to be something that we talk through with each individual woman in relation to heart health, depending on where they're at and whether they have a diagnosis of heart disease already. Yeah, I think it's interesting because, you know, we had almost a bad relationship or a bad idea of hormone replacement therapy because of certain tests years mm -hmm. ago. But that has been completely disproved. Mm -hmm. And even back then, and it's too complicated to get into it now, but the way that was correlated as well, there was a question mark over it, I believe, yeah. you know, going back over the years. But there are various types of HRT out there as well. I suppose that's interesting as well, isn't yeah. it, to, for people out there listening? 
I think uh, and particularly in, in relation to a lot of the topics we're talking about today, it's very, very important to say that there's a substantial difference between taking estrogen in a tablet form and taking estrogen, which is a skin-based product, so whether a gel or a patch. And that goes to the whole absorption and metabolism of that product. So when you take a tablet-based estrogen, you've automatically increased your risk of a blood clot. If you use a patch or a gel or a spray gel, it doesn't change your baseline risk of blood clot at all. Wow. Um, so very, very significantly, doctors have migrated predominantly to prescribing patches, gels, spray gels, and it would be very rare that we would use a tablet-based hormone therapy now. Yeah. I think the most important thing that we're hearing throughout this discussion is the fact that you need to talk to an expert and, and navigate the different forms, whether it's for yourself, like um, Maura, of course, you are on uh, medication yeah. for... And high cholesterol, no, just I wanted to throw that in. Yes. Yeah. And I had it, I'm just... Sorry for crossing in, but just it's a kind of an important one, I think, for women. Because I had high cholesterol maybe seven, eight years ago. It's now gone high again. I did lower it. My diet, all of the things that I was speaking to Arla earlier on there, uh, I seem to be doing everything by the book. But it's my LDL has gone up to 3.2, which is the artery blockage, which I was talking to a consultant a couple of months ago. And I have to get that back down again because I'm gone a bit high. So, you know, diet and everything, it, it, it possibly, stress is a big thing. So all of them are mixed together. So I suppose I just, and to say it to women, you just have to be careful. You, maybe go once a year. I, I go once every six months now. Mm. It's just... To check your bloods, is to it? Yeah, the bloods, the whole thing yeah. to well check. Well, you would, obviously, with, with the background yeah. there. So, so it's important to do that. It's an important one, yeah. And then you have a hormone balance if there's menopause and... I have to go. I had to go through all of them things lately in another situation as well. Okay. So, yeah. so I suppose so everything changes w with the menopause. With like age, yeah. and when we get older, we burn less calories as women. Yeah. And we do. So I suppose that's another thing. So this, it's a juggle. I think. Yeah. Women just have to watch everything. Well, I know. Uh, but <laughs> yeah. we don't want to be all depression here because you see, yeah. I actually no. think menopause <laughs> can be. Okay, a yeah. wonderful thing. And, and I believe it's almost like, I'd like to think of it like the, our second spring, Nicola, mm -hmm. that, Absolutely. you know, mm. I feel that the kind of narrative around the menopause, although it's amazing mm -hmm. that there's been a spotlight on it, I think we it's need good. to look at it as a positive thing, don't we? Well, when you look at some of those scores on quality of life and happiness mm. um, scores, um, women in their 50s are at their happiest. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> clearly, <laughs> each woman has to navigate her menopause in whatever way it. she finds most useful. Mm -hmm. um, but there is absolutely every opportunity to, to thrive. Yeah. Um, and we're more saying that we burn less calories. And maybe that's one way of looking <laughs> at it, but we're very, very efficient energy storage machines. So <laughs> yeah. we're incredibly <laughs> good at endurance yeah. exercise. We're not eating for hours. Um, <laughs> <d> it <laughs> takes a lot to keep a good woman down. You yeah. know, you can go <laughs> up and down mountains, you can go for miles and miles, and you've still stored all that energy. Yeah. So um, mm -hmm. you can use it to your very best advantage. Yeah. I was looking at a study the other day that has uh, changed my perspective on everything. And uh, well, the one thing that it hasn't changed for me is that apparently women get better at arithmetic in their 50s. And I'm like, obviously, I was left out of that part. <laughs> <laughs> that, didn't, that didn't come into my uh, spectrum at all of life. But there are so many things that we do get better at. And mm. confidence mm -hmm. is one, mm -hmm. because you really realize who you are and you feel good. And I'm yeah. sure mm -hmm. you see that yourself s from a psychological yeah. perspective. Yeah, absolutely. Change in confidence, a recognition of things that we're yeah. good at and that we can get better at things that we may have thought of ourselves as not. Well, that's arithmetic or anything else. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know what? I can get better at this. Yeah. You know, we come into a real change of power, and it's such a cliche to say it in that way. But I think there's such opportunities. Our well-being is higher. Yeah. We know what we know, and we know we can change things. Yeah. And you and you're right, as Nicola said, as Samantha. The reality is, there isn't anything you can't do just because you're a certain age. In the sense, you can still climb mountains. You can still yeah. do everything. I just think yeah. it's almost we need to maybe have a shift in uh, the way we think about mm -hmm. our changing time and ongoing into our 50s, 60s and 70s yeah. and onwards because we're all going to live longer. And that can be difficult when we've grown up in a culture which is very much predominated by young people or yeah. youth being, yeah. you know, when we think about this now, like we're all sitting here, we are women who are not in, you know, the flush of our yeah. early 20s, I imagine. <laughs> so, but 
you know, we think about, well, what does this mean? How do we start to reshape this narrative for ourselves, and for how our do friends, for our families? Can you give us families? any tips, though, in the sense of there is almost, is there a mindset that we have to embrace, a new mindset to help ourselves? Because we, you, you yeah. can talk about changing your diet, you mm -hmm. can talk about HRT and all, you know, menopause and different things. You can talk about, as Maura said, the realisation of heart, high blood pressure and, yeah. you know, heart disease and all that. But... What about the mind? I mean, are there something we should kind of, is there something we should kind of look at ourselves in the sense of a change of mindset? I think there is. And I think some of it can come from very small steps. I've been reading an interesting study on how the social media we consume and how intentional we are about that makes a difference. And it was asking women about who they see as role models for ways of being in their lives and how that was related to who they were following on different platforms. And, um, and they're identifying women who are at the same age or, or within the same decade as them, as women who had it together and how they saw that as aspirational. And then, you know, the next step in that study is to be asking them, well, what ways are you already like that? Okay. What ways are you taking care of business? What ways are you excelling? What, ways do what things are you doing well? And, and reflecting that then, I think, if I take that out of the research setting and think, we look at our friends and family and think like, aren't they going great? Aren't they just great women? And it's not for their age at all. You know, we're, we're very focused yeah, on for their everything age. Everything is for their age. Yeah, you know, it's no, almost like, doesn't she look at doesn't Jennifer she look Aniston? Doesn't she look good for her age? Doesn't yeah. she look good I feel for like her age? Isn't she's that such a backhanded more. compliment? Like, yeah. isn't she great? Look at the, you know, look at her making decisions. Look at her getting, getting, taking care of things and getting things done and progressing. Age is not irrelevant, it's but we need to think about the whole spectrum and how we live such w long and wonderful lives, hopefully. It's true. And I think the whole discussion on lowering your biological age ha yeah. is, is very much a now thing. And I think it's a very positive thing. Do you, do you think that, you know, we talk about changing, you know, diet and exercise instead of almost thinking I'm getting older and you're going down like this, thinking, no, I'm here and this is my second spring. Mm -hmm. So there's a mindset that has to change there in the sense of, I am X age, but really, Just you can measure. lower biological age by exercise, by diet, by all that. Mm. I, is that not true? Do you think that that's something we can do, Nicola? I think we certainly use it as a tool to help reflect that those life changes can improve, say, heart health. So we'll calculate a heart age. Yeah. Um, and if that's seven or eight years um, older than the person who owns the heart, then clearly that's not good. So it's a really good way of um, incentivizing someone. Well, if you made this one simple change and that small change, that then you're going to have a much younger heart. So we have to look at it that way. Um, I think certainly encouraging people to protect their body and, and, and think of how much it's, it's doing for them um, and that mm. it deserves mm -hmm. better is a, is a very good and very positive way to think about their health. Mm. Um, and, and that then will encourage people to engage in a range of activities. I would certainly say, you know, looking at it as things that are good enough rather than having to be perfect at some things. Sometimes people will say, oh, well, I ran out of time, so I didn't go for my walk. Whereas if you did 10 minutes, that's better than not having gone out at all. Mm -hmm. So any small changes um, are, are a positive step forward and better than doing no, no changes at all. Yeah. And, and I think especially Ernie, when you watch something like the Blue Planet or you look at people, and we all know people in society that are inspirational. They don't even know they're inspirational. <laughs> they're just doing their thing. They're not, po they're not ponderous. They're just continuing mm. as they were through the decades. And actually farming is a very good example of that. And I'm from a farming background yeah. as well. And in the farming background, there's no kind of cut off. I am now retiring. Most people just no, continue on. Isn't that right, Maura? Yeah, and also as well, um, on a farm, it's all go, go. So I just think you keep, you just, you know, you'll always be, you think you'll always be fit, but you're physically fit, I suppose. You need to go away. Whereas I started during COVID, I was telling the girls there, I started uh, boot camp during COVID because we <laughs> couldn't go. And I'm going to, <laughs> Tommy will probably kill me here now, but at the time you were only supposed to go 5K, but I said, you know what? The boot camp was 35 minutes away. You were on your own land, you're fine. You're grand, you're grand, yeah. It was 35 minutes away, and sure, look, yeah. I did it. We did it, but and did we did. Did you find now that all yeah. that has really changed your mindset? Because yeah. you are a kind of walking example of a lot of people. Yeah, but you needed that today. to get away from the daily thing that you did day in, day out, day in, day out at home in the circle of your day. And it's just to have something different. So 
I'm finding those small things, the bit of fitness, which was the boot camp. Um, we have another one that's after starting up locally. It's an ex -arm, uh, He's an army guy, and he started with us the other morning in the <laughs> local hall. So, you know, they, they're the type of things that's getting women back out. There's older women now in that group, and it's great to see people that possibly would just only go to the shop and go home and not get out. Socialization is very yeah. important. Mm -hmm. And, and I it is. Mm -hmm. That's really important. That, that's probably yeah. is good for a your farm, heart health too. Yeah, the farm is good. You're always work, work, and you're yeah, busy, and you're busy. Insular. But you need a, another kind of a go-to. An outlet. An outlet, yeah. yeah. Yeah, how important is socialization? Or go as to we the mart. It's true. I go to the mart. The mart socialization. <laughs> yeah. Samantha, how important is socialization as as we as we get older to keep us young? Critically important. Yeah. It doesn't mean that we're all built in the same way and that we're all you know need to be extroverts and out all the time and away making friends at boot camp and so on. We need to think about how how do our relationships sustain us? How do they enrich our lives? Having friends or family or social contact has a direct link to our physical health. You know through some complex kind of biological processes but we all know that when we spend time with people who we care about and care about us we feel better and that has a direct link to our health so it's so important and I think as you know over the past few years and the challenges we've had whatever we however we've done our 5k limit or not yeah um, like I went over my <laughs> 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 I don't care but we might yeah. just think I do it again <laughs> <laughs> but how do we you know I think about boot camp boot camps great in all kinds of ways but one of the ways it's great is it's the social connection yeah. we're social beings yeah. and we need that that is very important um nicola what would you say just for people watching here now that are a little bit worried that you know they may have put on a bit of weight they may have that you know around their midriff especially around you know mi menopause time and all that i mean what are the what's the first step that you would say just for their heart health from a medical perspective uh, well, not their weight, because um, it's upsetting for women to see no, their weight. No, but weight in different, yeah. as yeah. you said, dangerous weight, yeah. maybe, I'll say, in, in the wrong areas. So, I mean, you, if there are small things you can change yourself before considering getting a health check with your doctor, then right. those are worth looking at what you feel you, you could do. Cigarettes are probably number one. Mm. Um, and it's extraordinary how many Irish women are still smoking. So... Mm. That's one mm. thing that I would really say, if you think that now is the time that you might be able to consider stopping smoking, then that's an enormous, an enormous thing is to do. Is that the biggest risk for heart disease and stroke? Well, when you look at, look, say even family members who would have the same risk factors, they've got the same genes, um, and you look at the difference in the progression of disease with the smoker, as opposed to a non-smoker, it's, it's quite shocking. Um, so when we look at what can be one of the most meaningful things to do, stopping smoking is up there. Um, looking at their alcohol intake is important too. And then perhaps getting those health screenings so that they find out what their blood pressure is, that they know what their numbers are, that they look at their cholesterol, and that they reflect that based on their family and, and what kinds of risks they have. Mm. Can I just ask you about alcohol? Because... There's con there's constant shift when it comes to what we should and shouldn't mm -hmm. do. If there was a time with a glass of red wine was very good for you, then you hear, no, no, maybe you shouldn't have any alcohol at all. What's your own view on alcohol? Well, what we know is that women don't metabolize alcohol as effectively as men. We're missing an enzyme. Um, we can cry about it if we want, but the fact is we're missing <laughs> an enzyme. <laughs> okay. um, the current guidance... We can't break it down, is that <laughs> it? <laughs> yes. Yeah. And so we're much more likely to develop liver damage with a similar intake of alcohol to an equivalent man um, because our livers can't cope with it. Um, so the guidance to us now, I, I, I translated this into real speak because in Europe they told us 100 milligrams of alcohol per week. And it's like, what? So yeah. what that is, I've, I've, I've done the math Jean. so you don't have <laughs> to. Okay, good. <laughs> we're, all, we're all listening. We're all ears. So that is a litre of 12.5% wine. A litre? doesn't matter red or white. Yeah, you can have that in a week? In a week. That's not bad. Well, I think that's actually <laughs> quite no, I think, a lot, you know, it's not like, I mean, you know, people think, okay, I have to give up. No. And then they you kind of freak out. No uh, yeah, but seriously, is that yeah. the people get very, very stressed about yeah. if they like mm. to be social and they get very nervous. And then there's the other, the other side of it's like, sure, listen, this great wine is great for me. So a litre and a half. Yeah. Now, obviously, in Ireland, we, we have a very significant pattern of taking all our alcohol units. On the yeah. one occasion mm -hmm. in the yeah. week, it would obviously be much better if Does we spread it out. Does that make a huge difference, binge drinking? So it certainly seems to be significant to things like blood pressure. Yeah. Um, so it takes mm. a physical toll. Ironically, cardiovascularly, it's bad. 
to binge drink. From a liver health, it's much better <laughs> because your <laughs> liver can regenerate in the days after your yeah. big night out. Yeah. Um, but, but from a heart health and blood pressure, it would be better to be more measured, you know, to yeah. spread that on two or three occasions. In health, what we know is it's very, very, very useful to have alcohol-free days so that if we, if people are you know taking weekdays that they don't take alcohol and then having a few evenings that they might have some drinks that's mm. that's going to be something their body will cope with very very reasonably mm. um but in summary um because you know we don't know the uh, or, or <coughs> the symptoms maybe like Maury here didn't realize the symptoms in summary what would you be watching out for as a doctor when it comes to your heart health would it be tiredness, these these almost symptoms we don't expect, the symptoms that we're not used to, not the pain <laughs> in the chest or the ones, ones we're used to. Absolutely. Um, and uh, just a change in well-being. So if you're finding that your activities are exhausting you when normally you'd cope well, if your sleep is disrupted, um, if you're feeling overloaded, um, if you're feeling breathless, um, then any of those could be indicators that your heart um, needs some help. Yeah. You don't have to have the typical pain no. in the chest or the pain down your arm. That and is not the case with women. And it's actually less common in women. Yeah. It's less common. Even when someone's um, diagnosed as having a heart attack as a woman, often they'll still describe shoulder pain, but yeah. they won't have crushing central chest pain that we would usually yeah. equate to, I'm um, having a heart attack. Why do you think it is that we associate heart attack, stroke and heart disease with men rather than women? that men are more likely to die suddenly from heart disease. Women will develop heart disease, but they don't die immediately. Um, so uh, when we think about those critical events that happen, that sometimes people have witnessed or have happened in a family um, at a very young age, there, there's a higher proportion of those that are men. Um, as well, we know that a lot of women uh, would in the past have gone undiagnosed um, so that no one ever actually registered that they had heart disease, mm. so they weren't counted in statistics. Um, it's a bit like, and th this is slightly off topic, but we've got a lot of uh, medical studies that would suggest that women in China don't suffer menopause symptoms. Um, and I had a woman from China in my menopause clinic, and she had really severe menopause symptoms. And I was ha chatting with her. Uh, I said, you know, that this is really unusual and, and unfortunate for you because I understand your ethnicity seems to be a protection um, from really severe hot flushes, night sweats, those kinds of things. And she said, is it really though? Um, or is it the way the doctors recorded it in China? Mm -hmm. And Chinese women culturally are encouraged not to complain. Yeah. Um, and so your default answer to how you're feeling is, oh, fine. I'm fine. Yeah. yeah. And I think in women in heart disease, there's, there's potentially decades in the past where that would have been the case where it, it wasn't recorded. Mm. I think it's great to remind people of the statistics that one in four women dies from mm. heart disease and stroke every year. So that is the stat. It is not an exclusive male mm. disease. Orna, I suppose in conclusion for you as well, the reminders, I think the, the most important thing is that you can actually add food into the diet, but move more. Um, you know, listening to the conversation the last while, I've actually been really inspired listening to the different answers and that really, you know, b between the blue zones and the the boot camp and the dancing and all of that, that health actually means something yeah. very different for everybody. Mm -hmm. So I actually think a the, the, the take home message for me is that it's taking the time to figure out what health is for you. So it's not ticking all of the boxes that we all, you know, we're all so unique, we're all so different. So what you need to focus on is very different to what I need to focus on. So figure out what that is for you and what's fun and doable and mm -hmm. achievable for you. Um, in terms of take home messages from a diet point of view, I would say the, the, the plate, you know, the balanced plate, try to aim towards that where you can. Um, try to take a little bit of time aside to just get into the right mindset for change, figure out what, I what you could best benefit from from a food point of view again in our, our self-care and well-being journal and um, there's a kind of a checklist you can go through there so it's a really good starting point because sometimes we dive straight into the food mm -hmm. side of things without really getting into the right mindset for change and we have to have those you know cl clear powerful reasons for making a change 
that'll keep us g sticking to it when you know mm -hmm. we're tired and stressed and all that. Mm -hmm. So the, the the balance plate, you know, thinking about your mindset and just trying to eat generally a little less processed food. So focusing on whole foods, mm. as as little processing as possible. Okay. Remind us of what you can download online as well mm. on irishheart.ie. Yep, so on our website, um, irishheart.ie, we have that self-care and wellbeing <laughs> journal, which goes through all of those kind of behavior change aspects, but also some advice on diet, exercise, um, uh, the stress management, and mm. um, a whole range of things. How to talk to your GP about, you know, what questions how to, to ask navigate. Me. How to navigate yeah. this area, which I think is really, really good. And for people out there, they want to know mm. how, to, you know, the steps. So this is all in one. You can download it. You can have it as your document mm. and read it all. And all the steps are there. And you can do that. And there's also a lovely poster we've developed of you know, a month's worth of ideas for different heart healthy habits you can do. So some of them are food related. Some of them are just talking to people. You know, getting the conversation going, talking to the women in your lives. Um, getting the, the men to talk to the women in their lives, you know, spreading the message, yeah. getting this to be more part of the national conversation. So um, so that's kind of a, a, a nice place to go to if you're kind of wondering where, where to start. Yeah. So, um, but I think talk about it is the one thing. Mm -hmm. Don't ignore your senses, but also don't ignore the men folk in your life either. <laughs> L encourage people to discuss this mm. as being an issue that's out there so we can all help ourselves. Yeah, because every man, you know, has a woman in their lives, you know, a mother, a mother, a yes, partner, yeah. daughter, niece, whatever, friend, and so just talking is, is so important. And also, we have a fantastic range of um, heart healthy recipes on our website that are simple, stress free, and really tasty. Brilliant. Well, that's really good as well. You can make those. Uh, Samantha, for you, is just basically take stock, think of yourself. Yeah, take stock, think of yourself, think about your emotions a little bit more um, mm. and pay attention to it and have these conversations. I think Orna's advice about talking to people is critically important. I was looking at this image earlier and thinking, yeah. you know, we've today we've been talking a lot about menopause, but we might think about the younger women we know and how we might support them now to make changes that will benefit them across their lifetime. It's such a gift to give to our friends and our family um, and think about the younger women and how you can shape their health. Yeah, and information is most Absolutely. definitely power so don't waste so if, if you're not you know in the age group that we're kind of talking about these are wonderful resources for for people of any age woman or men and also as, as, as nicola said if you do the right things early even if it comes to medication and all that down the road it will help now we come to you last more because i suppose your message has to be get checked yeah the i, c I did say to the media when i was doing bits there for the last mm -hmm. couple of weeks Prevention is better than cure, and look, we don't always prevent everything at every time. But for me, the Irish Heart Foundation, um, I probably don't believe that I would be sitting here today if it wasn't for the Irish Heart Foundation. And, and the, the mobile nurses, unit, of course. And the mobile that unit. Yeah. That, and it's, look, at, it's at, just for people out there, it's at shows, it's at them. Well, hopefully, it'll, they'll come back into the marts again if we can get money from the government. I had to plug that there. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> you know, all of this is because farmers, as a farmer as well, as a mother, a carer, whatever the case may be, the same as any women here, they don't check it. So I it's to go and do this every few months or maybe when you get older, you need to do it every, few every six months for me anyway. But listen to your body, but I suppose, is what yeah, you're saying. To listen to your, yeah. yeah, because there will be symptoms. There may not be symptoms. I didn't have symptoms. That's why I'd say just go get checked. There's probably women out there now at the minute looking at this and they mightn't have got their blood pressure or their cholesterol checked in the last two years. Yeah. I'd say go get it done. You don't know, you're walking around, you don't know that you have it. Yeah. I didn't know and I'd say I had it six or seven months but I'm lucky to be here due to Brilliant. that just check that may have happened yeah. on Brilliant. the random time going home thinking I'm going well back to go away. Well, thank, go thank goodness that happened yeah. and, and you're here with us today. Uh, Maura Canning, thank you so much. Also, thank you. Dr. Samantha Dockery, uh, Dr. Nicola Corcoran and uh, Orna O'Brien as well. Thank you all for that discussion and enlightenment today. And for all of you joining us online as well, thank you very, very much. Her Heart Matters, hashtag Her Heart Matters is the campaign. Irishheart.ie, of course, part of the Irish Heart Foundation and all the information is there. So thank you so much for joining us.